Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. This is the fourth session of Abode Academy 2, and we're very happy to have everyone with us tonight. I'm Mary Thorsby, the Executive Director of Abode Contemplative Care for the Dying right here in San Antonio, and this is what Abode looks like. Many of you know that uh, here at Abode, we care for people who are in their last three months, weeks, or even days of life at no charge to them or to their family. We work with hospices across the city to bring in folks who need our contemplative care at end of life. And by that, we mean we are always very present and in the moment with our guests. Uh, we meet them where they are and we love, and love them up until they're ready to go. So that's half of our mission. The other half is that we teach the art of contemplative living and dying. So we put a strong emphasis on education. Um, we like to share our expertise and the expertise of so many others in our community. And it's our way of giving back to the community that supports us through volunteering, through sharing the good word about our work at Abode, and financially, without uh, financial donations to Abode, we simply couldn't do what we do. So thank you all very much. In keeping with the contemplative nature of the way that we do our work, we like to start each gathering with what we call a contemplative moment. And it's our way of everyone getting focused and ready uh, to uh, spend the next stretch of time together. So for that, I would like to invite our volunteer, volunteer coordinator, Susan Ruck. All right, would you all please join me in settling into a comfortable seated position with both feet on the floor you may choose to close your eyes as you inhale to a count of four. Pause and exhale to a count of four. Continue breathing in this way for five to six breaths. Leaving behind our cares for this day, let's turn our thoughts to advice from ancient scripture. And now, my friends, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. Deeply inhale the goodness, and as you exhale, send the goodness you have contemplated out into the world. All right.
right. You may open your eyes. And Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. A couple more quick things before I introduce our very exciting and interesting panel. I am recording tonight. We record all of our Abode Academy sessions, and you can uh, listen to the recordings and see the Zooms at abodehome.org education. Uh, if you have questions, and we hope you have lots of questions, please use the chat box. I'll follow along with that, and I'll pose your questions to our panelists at the end. And tomorrow morning, you'll receive a survey. Uh, your feedback on these programs are, is so important to us and very helpful as we plan our education programs going forward. So this round of Abode Academy focuses on preparing for the end, all of the things that we should do um, as we think about our departure from this life. We've covered how to talk about death, the legal details that we should attend to before we head out, and the personal details as well. In fact, Arthur Dawes led us last week in that program, and he's here tonight. Hi, Arthur. Tonight, we're focusing on the after party. After we die, where do we want our bodies to go? We're all familiar with the traditional in-ground burial, but what about cremation? What about leaving our bodies for medical students to study? What about leaving them up in Saint Mar uh, San Marcos at the body farm where researchers from around the world come to study uh, body decomposition? We are delighted to have Pat Sullivan here. He is a certified pre-arrangement advisor at Neptune Society. We have Linda Baker Weber. She's the program coordinator for the UT Health San Antonio Body Donation Program. And we have Dr. Danny Westcott. He's the professor and director of The Body Farm, Texas State Department of Anthropology. Each will talk about the purpose of their programs and why folks are drawn to them, uh, the costs, the requirements, how to involve our loved ones in these kinds of decisions, and, and plenty of other things. And I know we'll all have lots of good questions for them. So Pat, let's have you go first. Tell us about Neptune Society. Thank you very much, Mary, and I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to be here that you've invited me to attend these meetings. I found them very informative, but I want to point out, I really appreciate what I've learned about a bone. And I've told this story to Mary, but my wife had a very close friend who spent her last days at a boat a few years ago. And my wife visited many times during that period and cannot speak any higher of anybody than she does a boat. So I really appreciate what you folks who are associated with a boat do and provide uh, from what all my wife tells me, it's just amazing. So I was really honored to be asked to join y'all. Uh, now to kind of tell you a little bit about Neptune, of the three people who will speak this evening, my organization is the only one that is for profit. We're an ongoing business and that's what we, we provide services and you pay for them. Whereas uh, uh, with Linda and Dr. Westcott, I think most of their services come at no charge if you want to go that route. Most of what we do at Neptune is pre-need arrangements. Uh, to give you an example of a pre-need arrangement, uh, a few months back, I sold a, a lady a pre-need arrangement, and her son decided he wanted to go ahead and have one for himself. He was 30, he is 37 years old. He could easily live another 50 years. Once you put a plan in place with Neptune, the price never changes. It doesn't go up. It does not matter how many more years or decades you live it's taken care of. My wife and I put a plan in place in January of 2014, which was 
a little over six years before I ever imagined I'd become an employee of the Neptune Society, which this is, uh, I've come out of retirement to take uh, this job, been with them about a year now. Uh, previously, my wife and I owned furniture stores here and in Houston. Uh, we sold them a couple of years ago and I just didn't really care that much for being retired. So this is what I do now. A little bit about Neptune. We're, we're the oldest provider of direct cremations in the nation. And what exactly does that mean? It means we're really not a funeral home. We provide cremations. Now, what all does that consist of? Well, our program includes a lot of things. It's very comprehensive. We have a number of plans and I'll try to cover all of them here. And again, be happy for any and all questions that you may want to ask. Uh, that said, <laughs> the, the things that are obviously included that should be included in any plan are the transportation. We'll, our funeral service directors are on staff 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They'll come and answer the phone at any time. I know I just spoke to someone who had uh, a family member pass away in the middle of the night. They called and said at 2.30 in the morning, we were at the home to, to pick up their, their loved one. So that said, <clears throat> we, we provide that. We provide transportation. We provide it to our facilities. Uh, in our facilities, we have climate control quarters uh, where a person will be kept until a cremation is scheduled and then performed. Then we return the remains to the uh, designee that the people tell us. Now, we have two different ways. Again, I talked earlier about the pre-need. We also have what's called at-need. That's a different division in my office. And there, if you call Neptune because someone has passed away and you need to make arrangements, you will talk to someone in our pre, excuse me, in our at need uh, division, which are our licensed funeral directors. We have one office in San Antonio that's on Bandera Road, just inside Loop 1604. That's a couple of miles south of uh, Helotus. So that's our office here. It's just an office. We don't have a crematorium there. And the reason for that is Neptune in 2016, Neptune was started in, in 1973. Uh, but in 2016, we were acquired by Service Corporation International. And I imagine you're most of y'all are probably familiar with SCI. They're the largest funeral service provider in the world. So we have here in San Antonio, through SCI, probably a dozen or more funeral homes that are owned by SCI. <clears throat> so we generally, <clears throat> excuse me, we generally use Roy Acres, which is on Main Street near downtown. Uh, we own that one. We own all the sunsets here in this. There's three of them, I believe, here. We own Trevino, uh, ones in, in Live Oaks, so quite a few different funeral homes that we have. Now, the things that we also offer in our pre-need program or in our at-need program uh, consist of uh, a travel and relocation. And that's what got my wife and I interested in Neptune uh, back in 2014, or actually, I guess in 2013, we started looking into this, decided it's something we should put in place. Uh, fortunately, uh, my wife's parents both had plans in place. So when they passed away, we didn't have to go through all the things I went through when my father passed away in 76 of a heart attack that was totally un unsuspected. And then we had this scramble around and do all the things you have to do. And so it, it's certainly a, a lot better if a plan is in place. Now, I talked to a friend who told me about Neptune and that the reason he joined was because Neptune has the ability 
to pick you up anywhere in the world when you pass away. Now, that's not quite the case now. There's two exceptions, and I've never had this be a deal breaker for anybody. We currently will not pick you up in Iran or North Korea. So I haven't met anybody that thinks that's going to be an issue. But other than that, we will pick you up anywhere. Uh, you will be cremated through our associations or associates uh, pretty much wherever you are and remains returned to whomever you tell us to return them to. The other things that we offer, and it, a couple of these things are, are new since I joined, or my wife and I joined, and that is one, we have what we call loving memory. And loving memory is where we offer to have a limited viewing prior to the cremation. Now, this is done in one of our funeral homes, and it's not like the typical viewing you remember from a traditional burial. This one, since in most cases, cremation bodies are not embalmed. We can do it if you want us to, you want to pay for it, but nobody does. So it lasts about 15, 20 minutes, and it's, it's just for pretty much the immediate family. But that was introduced because people would say, I never quite had the opportunity to say goodbye. They were out of town when a person passed away, so they would like the opportunity to have a final goodbye. So we provide that if you'd like it. We also, a lot of people don't really know what they want to do with a person's remains once we return the remains to you. So that said, we offer where a person can choose to have the remains scattered and we will do the scattering and we do it in your choice of nine different locations. Four of them are in the Pacific Ocean, three of them are in the Atlantic Ocean, one of them's in the Gulf of Mexico, and one of them is in Rocky Mountain National Park. And lastly, the newest thing that we have to offer is we will now offer a celebration of life, a memorial service after the cremation is performed in one of SCI's chapels. Although we have a small chapel in our offices, but I think most folks would prefer to have a more appropriate chapel, which is in our funeral homes. So again, we've been around since 1973. We currently have about 700,000 living members. So that's a, a lot of people, far, way far more than anybody else in this industry has. And, you know, we provide provide services to, you know, anybody. There's, there's, you know, all you have to do is call us. We'll give you information. You can come to us. We'll come to you. We can do it over the phone. Uh, because of COVID, I've been working pretty exclusively from home and I'm able to sign people up for membership, uh, you know, over the telephone. So, you know, whatever works best for, for someone, we're happy to work with. I've worked with immediate need, which means, you know, someone's in hospice and we go ahead and, and get it set up for that person for when they do pass away. It really takes the load off the family. And that's what we really strive to do is make a person passing as easy as possible. We offer on everything, we will include what's called a memento chest. And our memento chest includes your choice of urns, 25 thank you cards and envelopes, a memory candle, which will hold some ashes if a family member would like that as a keepsake. And we have what's called a planning guide. And our planning guide asks a lot of questions that you can fill out to make it easy. And we, a lot of this was covered last week about passwords for getting on the computer, things like that. I think it was mentioned last week that there, there's people who, who, you know, they can't find it anywhere to get into some of these records and that you have to have. This all asks about life insurance policies, what's your policy number, who's your agent, who do we contact, what's your phone number, banking information, 
things that you can go through and change over all your life. So with the memento chest, which is a pretty uh, chest, high gloss, it, it, you proudly display it anywhere. You just tell your family members at the time of my passing, open this chest, it'll make things a lot easier. We also provide a website that you can go on and put a photograph. You can do an autobiography. You can also do an audio recording. That's private to you until such time as you pass away. And then it goes out to anyone that you authorize to see it for one year. And lastly, anyone who's a member, if you have a child or grandchild or grandchildren under the age of 21 and unmarried, if heaven forbid something tragic was to happen to them, we will provide that service at no charge as long as you're still a living member. Mm -hmm. So those are things, those three things are included in everything we offer. The other things I mentioned, the travel, the viewing, the scattering of the ashes, the celebration of life, those are options. If you don't want them, you don't have to have them. It's not a problem, but we, we'll take care of you. And I really encourage anybody I talk to to go online and look at our customers or our family members reviews of Neptune Society, we're pretty much five stars across the board. So I take great pride in working for the Neptune Society. Obviously I put my money where my mouth is when I signed up to join back in 2014. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. You can send them to me on chat and I'll reply back or save them and get them to marry, whatever whatever works best for you, I'm happy to provide. So again, I appreciate all that you folks do at Abode, and I appreciate you having me here this evening. Thank you very much. That was great. Linda Baker Weber, tell us about the UT Health uh, Body Donation Program. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, this is my first Zoom call, so bear with me. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, with the body donation program, quite often people pre-register and they come to the program because they want to give back to the medical students, dental students, and allied health students. Some of the donors have been doctors or nurses or affiliated with the medical field, so they want to give back. Um, they can pre-register on, uh, we have the forms on our website, or they can call me or email me and we will send the forms to them. Uh, there's no cost to register. Quite often people will ask, is there a fee to register? There is no fee to register. The fees that are involved would be if they want the cremated remains returned, there is a fee of $250. I've been with the program uh, 13 years and the fee hasn't changed. Uh, there are people that registered prior to fees being charged and they're grandfathered in. If they want the remains returned, we don't charge them. We have a funeral home that's on contract by us that takes care of the removal and bringing them to the school. At the end of the program, they can be in the program, excuse me, up to five years. And up, upon completion, they are cremated here at the school. We don't send them out to another crematory. They're done here and we will notify the family when they are ready to be returned and we will we'll mail them out uh, express mail. The only other additional fees would be if they are outside of 100 miles. So the school takes care of the first 100 miles from the place of death back to the school. Anything over that the family will have to pay for. Occasionally there are times when we have to secure a third party mortuary because of traffic, weather, just different situations, then the family would have to pay that fee for that mortuary to come and get that their loved one and keep them until the funeral home we have on contract will go for them. Our number is a 24 hour number. After hours is answered by the funeral home that we have on contract, a screening is done to make sure the person is eligible for the program. We do have some exclusions. There's some height and weight restrictions. Uh, we do not take anyone with COVID or any other communicable diseases, such as hepatitis, herpes, AIDS, HIV, tuberculosis. As long as none of the exclusions are present at the time of death, we will accept them. 
There's a misconception a little bit on our form that says uh, organs being removed. Sometimes they've had a hip uh, replacement or a knee replacement or uh, lung removal, whatever. That doesn't exclude them if that was done prior to death. That exclusion applies if the, if the uh, organs are harvested at the time of death for transplant. The only organ that they can have harvested and still come to us at the time of death is the corneas. Um, anything else would exclude them. Uh, another exclusion would be death caused by severe trauma, motor vehicle accident, drowning, suicide, homicide. And it does mention on our, on our uh, instructions about cancer. Cancer is on a case by case basis. It depends on the stage and where it's located. Uh, we do look mostly in the abdominal region if it's there, if it's metastasized. Um, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. I apologize. Oh, you're, doing, you're doing great. You're doing great. Tell us what students learn from having real bodies with a purpose. They learn the anatomy. They're taught the anatomy. Um, there's not research done. Quite often people think that the bodies are used, that we do research on a top autopsy is done. It is not. They learn the, the anatomy of the body. And quite often that's their first patient because they learn what they need to know to, to, to be a physician or a dentist or allied health students. Um, when the ashes are not returned to the families, we have a ceremony every year. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we didn't have one in 2020. It's a burial ceremony that we have here on campus. Very nice ceremony. Uh, the families are welcome to come. We send them out an invitation with a map. It's held in the spring. Um, we have seats, seating for the families. Uh, we give out carnations and roses. The staff, uh, faculty speaks and the students also speak to express their, their appreciation for the participants to our program. Um, the director is always speaks. We try to have a, our airline does a flyover. We have bagpipers. We have uh, the chorus from UTSA. And we also, I took it upon myself to invite uh, to do the uh, honors, military honors, because we do have military participants that are in our cemetery. So we do have the the volleys and the folding of the and presenting of the flags. So it's, it's a real nice ceremony and all of this is on our website. Um, I'm new to a boat. This is my first time. I've never heard of it. I do apologize, but I'm, I'm it's, it's very, very, from what I've heard, it's very, very good program. It's very interesting. And it, it's, it's uh, beneficial to the families that are going through losing their loved ones. And I'm glad to be invited to be, be a participant in this this, uh, meeting tonight. Um, I know I'm forgetting something and I'm sure there's a lot of questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask, uh, send the chat or call me, email me. My email is on the website. Uh, my, the phone number is on the website as well. Uh, this uh, calls are returned by myself and Rebecca Cantu. She works from home, remotely from home due to the pandemic, but I'm in the office every day. I'm not lucky enough to stay at home. I have to be here to <laughs> handle everything that needs to be handled. Wonderful. We'll post some questions at the end, Linda. Thank you. And I'll also be sure to add, uh, share everybody's websites and email uh, in the survey tomorrow. Thank you. All right, Dr. Danny, what is the purpose of the body farm? Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's been enjoyable listening to everybody talk so far. Uh, so we are a little bit different program. So we are a an academic center within the Department of Anthropology at Texas State University. And so um, we have a, a pretty broad mission, but it, it really breaks down into an education component, an outreach component, a service component, and then research. And so um, in reality, in some ways, our, our Will Body Donation Program is associated with all of those. So we do uh, conduct research, we also do uh, cold case work for law enforcement. So if they find badly decomposed or skeletonized remains, we help um, do the identifications 
uh, of those individuals. Uh, we do uh, education and training. So uh, we obviously have our own students that we train, but we also train uh, law enforcement and medical legal death investigators from around the world. Uh, we also do uh, training for canine handlers. Um, and then we have an outreach program. And so this is actually one of the things that involves our students a lot, but we do programs for K through 12 uh, and then for local co uh, community interest groups. Uh, so the, the, even the, the skeletal remains from the donated collections will be utilized, for example, to uh, teach uh, uh, young children about STEM programs and about human variation and about forensic science. Um, so we do have a wheeled body donation program, obviously, and then this wheeled body donation program, um, individuals donate specifically to us, so we're not part of a pooled donation program. Um, and we will accept, most of the time what we accept are individuals that have pre-registered with us, and we refer to them as our living donors. So these are people that register while they're alive. And we ask for as much history information as you're willing to give us. Uh, the more we know, the, the better it is for the research that, that will be done. Um, we also will take next to kin donations uh, if the legal next to kin donates the body, as long as the legal next to kin has not been estranged from the family member. So what we want are people that understand what their bodies are gonna be used for and that, that are okay with that. Um, so because of the fact that we, you know, obviously go through a little bit different than most people. So when we receive bodies, they are uh, initially placed in an outdoor facility uh, where they are allowed to decompose and research is conducted on those remains while they decompose. And it depends on the research protocol that person is assigned to. So there are scientists from around the world that come and do the science, do it. And just depending on when the body is received uh, and whether it fits their criteria is what it depends on what it's assigned to. And in some cases, the body might be assigned to more than one study at a time. Uh, and so typically the bodies are left out there from about six months to several years. At that time, they are brought, or at that time, they are usually used to then train uh, law enforcement on how to recover remains. So if they were to find a, a body in a field or something of that nature, uh, we train them on how to recover and to get the most uh, information out of those remains. Then they are brought back to the laboratory where our students process them down to a skeleton. And we, in this process, we use uh, a lot of undergraduate students and they really get to learn their bone anatomy. Uh, they get to see a lot of human variation. Uh, it also gives us a chance to talk about, you know, the information that we can see from the bones to, to our undergraduates. Uh, at that point, the skeleton is put into the uh, Texas State Donated Skeletal Collection. And so we retain these skeletons in per perpetuity. Um, and so at this point, they are just used over and over and over and over again for different studies. Um, in some cases, you may have a, a, a skeleton that is used you know, 10, 15 times a year in, in different research. And this will continue on forever. Um, uh, so for example, just to give you an example, the donation uh, donated bodies that are at the Smithsonian in what's called the Terry Collection have been being used for about 150 years now by different researchers. And so this collection is very similar except that we have lots of information about our donors, which provides a lot of ability to uh, do research on those skeletal remains. Um, as far as the costs, there is no cost to the family as far as we are concerned, but there could be some costs. So we will pick up the remains within a, a hundred mile radius uh, at no charge. If, you, if it's beyond that, then the family is um, responsible for any costs that are associated with uh, delivery of, from a funeral, by a funeral home, and the family will pick that funeral home. Uh, and then, of course, any cold stories that would go along with that. 
or uh, a lot of times we have uh, the bodies flown to the Austin airport. So we get people uh, from all over the place that donate their remains. And a lot of times what they do is they fly them into the Austin airport and we pick them up from there. Uh, so those are really the only costs that are associated with it. Um, and then uh, we will file a death certificate. Uh, we can act as a funeral home in that sense, but we don't issue death certificates. So if you have to go through the county to get the death certificates, then there is a, a fee for that. Um, and the state has recently changed that to where we are the ones that are responsible for the cost of that up front. Um, and because of the fact that sometimes we have individuals that die with no family members and we have to uh, absorb those costs, there is a, I think we charge a $4 fee for that process. Um, so like some of the benefits of, of this, of our program is, is that um, <clears throat> some of the things that people really talk about is the fact that we uh, utilize the remains over and over and over again. Uh, we involve everybody from, you know, small children to some extent to, to the actually the people that have donate or are planning on donating our remains. Uh, we have a lot of people that, that donate the remains that are associated with education and law enforcement. And a lot of times what they're trying to do is get back to the, um, the science that, that helped their, their careers. Um, we also have a lot of uh, people that um, donate just because they, they wanna be useful after life. Uh, we have some people that donate because they want a, uh, a green burial. So that is actually one thing I should have said earlier is one of the uh, uh, requirements for us is that you are not embalmed or preserved in any way. Um, um, and then another qualification, I guess, is that we are a, a lot different than, than uh, the medical school. So like Linda was talking about, we have very few restrictions. Uh, really, our only restrictions are that, the, that you're not over 500 pounds at the time of death and that you don't have certain uh, uh, diseases. Uh, tuberculosis is one of those. Um, but... Uh, if, for example, with us, if you are pre-registered with us, we do accept individuals that have died of COVID. Um, let's see, what else? Um, let's, some of the challenges associated with our program that are a little bit different, though, is, is that we um, depend <clears throat> largely on our, our students that are learning to collect data, but also to help uh, to pick up the remains and to place the remains. And so obviously they are often in class and they um, don't work through the middle of the night uh, because they're not being paid for this. And so uh, we are somewhat restricted as far as, uh, you know, we can't come during, in the middle of the night to pick up the bodies. And we, um, you know, it may take us a few hours during the day, depending on what's going on. Um, and we can pick up the, but we can pick up the bodies from any place except a private residence. We can't do that. Um, let's see. As far as it, it, what we recommend for people, as far as their loved ones, is that if they're interested in this, that they file the paperwork with us. Uh, if you are filing this paperwork, we have people that are in their 20s that have filed the paperwork, and they just can send, can, can consistently send us updated information occasionally. So that, that helps. And so that when they do pass away, we have the most up-to-date information. Um, for me, for example, I have a file that I have started and I have, you know, I throw things in there. Like I had a CT scan done a few months ago. And so I put that in my file so that in case somebody wants to see that later on, they can. Uh, but any kind of information like that we asked for, we also, um, ask people to send us photographs of them uh, at different stages of their lives. And the reason for this is, is that we also use this to look at uh, uh, training uh, artists on how to do facial approximation. So uh, if we find skeletonized remains, can they uh, reconstruct what you would have looked like when you, before you died? 
Um, but you have to involve your loved ones in this because we have no way of knowing uh, when you pass, they have to call us. So uh, if you register, what we do is we will send you a little card that says you're registered, um, but it's really up to you to, to let your, your family members know that they're interested in this and that, that you're interested in this and, that, uh, and, and who to call. Uh, the other thing is for our next of kin donations. In reality, it only takes the one legal next of kin to donate the body. But if that legal next of kin is, a, is children, we always require that all of the children agree on it or we do not accept the remains. So in, in our case, we are, you know, in some ways very similar to a medical school, but then again, you know, in a very different in a lot of other ways. Um, so I think I can stop there and then I'll be glad to answer any questions you have as well. Great. Thank you. Thanks, all three of you. That was really good. Really good. We've got quite a few questions. I think what we'll do is start from the bottom and go up, if that's okay. Um, Dr. Westcott, are the bodies exposed to different conditions like underwater, buried, or are they just in an outdoor facility, facility in ambient conditions? Uh, it depends on the research protocol that's going on at the time. Uh, we typically, because just where because we're located at, we don't do much associated with water, but we will any kind of or so we will kind of replicate different studies. So they may be wrapped in tarps, they may be, um, you know, uh, placed in a vehicle, they may be um, buried uh, and buried in different positions. Uh, there, so that can that can vary quite a bit. Uh, in some cases, what we might do is actually try to answer a question specifically about a, a, a case that the police have. So we've had cases where the police said, you know, we think this has happened, is it possible? And we will try to replicate the, uh, that scene. Um, we just did one, for example, for Williamson County uh, to kind of show, um, to see if we could replicate a scene that they had. So those kind of things might be done as well. And I loved, uh, we were talking the other day and you said that sometimes family members will come back and want to visit their loved one's skeleton. Right, so we don't allow it, obviously people to go out to the decomposition facility, uh, family members, because you just don't wanna see your loved one in that kind of state anyhow. But once they are skeletonized and they've been processed down and they're in the laboratory, we do allow family members to visit the lab. And so we get a variety of, we don't get a lot of people, but we do get some and they will vary from people coming in and we have a kind of a lobby area and they, some people just come in and sit down in the lobby and sit there for a while and then they get up and leave. And then we have some families that we set a time aside and they actually come in and we lay the skeleton out and we talk about what we can tell from the skeleton and they reminisce about things that they remember, you know, so for example, we have a, a family that comes in and we were talking about a, a, a fracture that the individual had and they remembered when that happened. And, the, and so they were able to tell us all about the event that happened. And so it actually provides us more information and it allows them to, you know, to think about their loved one. Uh, this is a question for uh, Danny and for Linda. How many folks do you like to have each year? Will you just take as many as possible, or do you have a set number of bodies that are ideal for your intake? Uh, for, well, for us, it kind of depends on what we think is gonna happen for the research that year. So we kind of, at the beginning of the year, kind of try to figure out what we're gonna need. Um, for us, probably the maximum is about 70 individuals that we can, because I, I, I don't want anybody to not be utilized in a, in a study. Uh, so that's about the maximum that we could do, uh, but we usually range between about 50 and 70 individuals a year. And Linda, your program? We don't have a maximum because they're used for various uh, programs. Since I've been here, we've never, had a max where we couldn't take anyone and generally anywhere from 100 to 150 a year that we accept 
Uh, there are some that we do have to decline, but for the most part, we don't have a we don't have a ceiling. We take we just as long as they qualify us at this point, we take them in, into the program. Yeah, and we, I, I should say though, we we will not turn down uh, the living donors, even if we are more than what we would normally do. We find something for them. And Linda, you were talking about um, some restrictions around cancer. That you you can you talk a little bit more about that? How do you determine? We ask. Uh, the nurse or the family members, uh, what type of cancer, where it's located, if it's metastasized and what stage it is. It's been very few instances that we have not accepted any that had cancer that even were metastasized in the abdomen region. And the reason why we question that is because when the cancer metastasized, the organs, if it's involving more than one organ becomes one solid mass. So it's hard to teach the organs if they've massed together from the cancer. But we, so far we've um, been accepting them even with the, the metastasis. They just, uh, in addition to the students using the, the, the donors, uh, we have San Antonio College, they teach the mortuary science. So they, they use the students, uh, the, the, the donors. And we also have doctors coming in from the military bases, um, other parts of the country to teach new procedure, develop new procedure, new equipment. We even have the um, medical equipment companies coming in with their staff, teaching them how to use, demonstrate the equipment to the doctors and the nurses. So they can be in the program up to five years. And because of that, that's why we can, can take so many because they're using various ways. Uh, first responders, air life, they come in and get taught procedures. We had a guest at above uh, this past fall who donated her body to your program. And I love uh, the way you refer to your donors as the honored silent teachers. One of the students made that comment in his speech at the, at the memorial, at the uh, burial ceremony. So I've incorporated that when I send out my emails or my letters that we are honored to have them and we regard them as our honored silent teachers because they are some of the students, they are the students' first patients, and we are honored and, and appreciate them coming to the program. Uh, we, here's, here's a question about organ donors. So you, you'll only take a, a uh, you'll, you'll take a body if the eyes have been we'll, harvested? If the, yes, if the eyes have been, the corneas have been harvested, we'll still take them. Any other organs that have been harvested at the time of death, we will not be able to accept them. Sometimes family members want to have, uh, even the individual would like to have, um, they have Alzheimer's or dementia, they want to research it on the brain. There's a different organization here at the school that they would have to go to, but we wouldn't be able to accept them once they harvest the brain for research. And again, that's because it doesn't show the full we have, to have all, we have to have all the organs in order to teach the anatomy. So that's the reason why. So this is a good question. How would you suggest someone to navigate their willing, their living will to state that they want to do both? I generally, if it comes up, I tell the families they can register for both. They can be with the organ donation program, but let them know if organs are harvested, if they sold, or if they go to uh, Tosa, then they wouldn't be able to come here. And the family would have to make final uh, decision on the disposition. They'd have to make those arrangements because sometimes they can be registered for both and they're not qualifying for the organ donation, then they would come here. But I was asking to let us know that when we can put that in the file that we know that that's one of their choices and to let the organ donation know that they registered here as well. Okay. Oh, let's see. H, H requirements or restrictions, Linda? Can you take people of all ages? All ages. Uh, the. If it's someone that is, um, is pregnant, as long as the fetus is six month gestation, then we can accept them and there's no age limit after that. How about um, religious beliefs? Are there religions uh, that frown upon cremation, frown upon body donation? Can, can uh, any of you speak to that? None that I'm aware of. Um, 
I know there's I, I don't know specifically what religion, but I have heard of some that do not believe in cremation. And there are others that prefer cremations, but we don't get involved in any of that. That's something the family would have to handle. I haven't run across that. I have had, I've been asked that a time or two, but I have not run across anyone who is from a rule has come and told me that I'm unable to do this because of, of my religion. I've been asked by folks of various religions and I've directed them to go and speak with a pastor or a rabbi or, or a priest or whatever is, is appropriate and let us know. And one of them came back to me and said, well, we're, we're ready to get signed up now. We went and talked to our priest and he said he had his mother cremated. <laughs> So I, I haven't, but but I'm sure there's some out there. I just haven't run across any. You were talking, uh, Pat, the other day about some unusual ways people have released their ashes. I was asking, we've, we've heard uh, that you can put ashes, you can make them into diamonds, make them into jewelry. Can, she, can you share some examples of unusual things that folks have done with their ashes? Probably the most unusual one I've encountered is a lady who found a company in Branson, Missouri that would take your remains and put them into fireworks, shoot off the fireworks and record those on tape and then provide that tape for, for posterity for you to see forever. So that one, and our name Neptune comes from back when we started Back in 73, we had a reef off the coast of Los Angeles where we began and we would put uh, the, the urns in the reef. And uh, that lasted up until through when we joined in 14, but today it's filled and we can't do that. But I <clears throat> sold a man uh, a while back who's having us send his remains whenever, whenever you know, that takes place to a company in Florida that lets you pick from a variety of sites that they are incorporating uh, concrete reefs with the, the remains. Uh, and I don't think you're in one, one, uh, one reef by yourself. I think you're in mixed in with a lot of other people, but then they hoist the concrete reef with your remains and others into various parts of the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. So there's, and, and I had one person ask me, I want some, I'd like to get a hummingbird that has a place to hold some ashes. And I said, well, that's not something we do, but I'll, I'll try to research it for you and get back to you. Well, I went online, I found a place that probably had 500 different styles of hummingbird that you could put ashes in. So all sorts of options there. They can also, I think, shoot you into space, but I haven't researched that one yet. I see in the chat, uh, Pat, that you're answering folks' questions. Cremations are outnumbering burials. Is that true? That is true. That's, I think, in the last five years or so, uh, cremations passed traditional burials. A couple of reasons for that. One is Dr. Westcott was talking about. It's more green. People are leaning towards the environment trying to protect it, and it's more green than a traditional burial. But the biggest reason, I'm sure, is that it costs about 75% less than a traditional burial. So those reasons, and then a prenatal arrangement, people are just taking responsibility for themselves instead of leaving it for their family members to deal with at the time of their passing. And there's, there, some of you may remember when the baseball player Ted Williams died or when the singer James Brown died, their families, they hadn't left anything with direction for what they wanted at the time of their passing. And they wound up going to court with their families trying to determine what they were, if they were gonna be uh, cremated, buried, or in the case of Ted Williams, uh, he was frozen. Wow. Danny, do you have a favorite skeleton? 
You mean as far as like a don donor scalp or yeah. bone? In your collection, is there one in particular that you that you use a lot, or which one which one gets used the most? Um. Well, yeah, I, I, we have a lot that get used, and well, for us. Um, so there is one individual that uh, is kind of unique. Uh, it, just in the fact that he's got a very uh, a long history uh, that I use to to teach students about fracture patterns. Um, so he was hit by a car as a kid, uh, and then also had a couple surgeries that were kind of unique. Uh, and then, um, unfortunately, he was hit by a car again, and that's what killed him. And so there's a mixture of fractures that are healed and unhealed. So it makes him very interesting to study, I imagine. Yes, yes. So I asked this question of all three of you when we spoke the other day. Pat, we know you're going to be cremated. Linda, do you think that you'll leave your body for medical students? And Danny, would you leave, are you planning to leave your body to the body farm? I haven't decided yet. I'm still kind of straddling the fence on that one. I know it's a good program. I believe in it strongly. I'm just not accepting cremation yet. My family has never done it, so I'm just not so sure. I've talked with my son and he said, whatever you want to do, mom is fine with me. So I'm just still kind of straddling the fence. Got it. And Danny? Uh, I, I will definitely donate my body. Uh, so like I said, I, I, I have a file that's going for, for me. So right now I am actually have my body donated to the University of Tennessee. Uh, this is where I, it's kind of the original uh, decomposition facility. It's also where I got my um, doctorate degree. And the main reason that I'm there and not at Texas State University is because if I was to die right now, it would be my students that would have to place my body. And it doesn't really bother me, but I, it's not really fair to them. So, um, and I've been gone from Tennessee long enough that they won't really matter. Uh, if things go well and I don't die before I retire, um, then I will probably switch to the university or Texas State University because uh, I actually prefer uh, Texas over Tennessee a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been great. Uh, I think what we'll do is any question that we didn't get to, I'll send it around to the panelists and get answers, and then I'll send the answers back um, through an email to everybody. Uh, wow, I really just I'm fascinated by all three options and so very much appreciate you all speaking to us this evening. Um, I want to remind everybody that next week we're going to be talking about green burials. We have Sonny Markham and uh, Gennaro Reyes. Sonny is a longtime abode supporter and volunteer, and she owns Countryside Memorial Park, and they do green burials. So the two of them will talk to us about uh, everything that's involved with that next week. So with that, gosh, I hate to end it, but this has just been great. Thank you very much. I'll send a survey tomorrow. And again, we'll follow up on any questions that, that didn't get answered. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a safe night. Be safe, everyone.